All right, folks, I think we're going to get started. Um, sorry for the delay. We, we had a ferry just come in and it has like a bunch of people on it and they're all stuck in the line to check into the hotel. Uh, so people will continue to trickle in, which is a good thing. Um, welcome everyone. Welcome to Bremerton, Washington. Uh, I'd like to just take a, a, a quick minute to introduce uh, Chairman Forsman. Um, he's the chairman of the Suquamish tribe, and we're uh, very thankful that he's here today to kind of kick us off. Um, so with that, uh, Chairman Forsman uh, has held uh, the chairmanship since 2005. In 2017, um, Chairman Forsman was elected president of the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians, which represents 57 Northwest tribal governments from Oregon, Idaho, Washington, Southeast Alaska, North Carolina, and Western Montana. So he's not very busy, um, which is probably why he could be here tonight. Uh, in 2013, President Obama appointed Chairman Forsman to the Advisory Council on the Historic Preservation. Uh, he recently completed his tenure on that council and more recently served on Governor Inslee's Southern Resident Orca Task Force. Uh, the Suquamish people continue to live in the Puget Sound area as they have for thousands of years. Among their historic leaders are Chief Seattle and Chief Kitsap, which we hope to hear a little bit more about. So with that, uh, if you could please help me welcome Chairman Forsman. Thank you for the introduction. I apologize for um, the motivational speech I gave before you came out. <laughs> Just had the uh, grandson uh, dropped off kind of unexpectedly, and so I got to get back at some point. But he's uh, my, my brother's got him for now, so everything's fine. He's not alone. Um, so, anyway, I'm Leonard Forsman, uh, chairman of the Squamish tribe, and uh, I'd like to welcome you here to our homeland. Um, here in Bremerton. Uh, our people have been living here for thousands of years and primarily on what we call the Kitsap or Great Peninsula, um, which is now most of Kitsap County. Um, it's known as Kitsap County today. And our people were primarily fishermen and clam diggers and hunters and berry pickers and just relied upon these lands to provide a uh, way of life just like many of the tribes um, here in uh, Puget Sound did. Um, we lived in winter villages uh, made from cedar. cedar. The cedar tree was super important here. Western red cedar was the primary cedar tree that we had that provided uh, wood for our homes, um, bark for uh, baskets and clothing and uh, hats and other tools. And then, uh, also wood for our canoes. So uh, the canoes are super important, of course, to all of us. Um, here at, um, on, um, on the waters here, uh, where we live, we have a lot of small streams. So we didn't have a big river. Um, so we had to stand out in different areas to get enough salmon to, and other fish to uh, provide uh, enough for the winter time. So that was kind of the focus was the winter ceremonials and uh, having those uh, important uh, events occur um, once we got enough fish and berries and beer and all those things stored up and put away um, so that we could have those um, celebrations and also uh, protocols that were super important for us. They're thanking the Creator for all of the gifts that have been provided to us through the year. So a lot of the this time people will be coming out of the houses and starting to get out and about in their canoes and, and starting to harvest fresher foods as they came through. Um, there were some spring salmon runs, um, but for the most part uh, was in the summer and into the fall that was focused on that this was a time when people started to move around. Um, I did uh, 
I want to say a little bit about uh, our major our major winter house, which is an old man house, which is Seattle. Uh, was born and raised, and that's where his, his father helped build that, which you could sell. And at one time, it was one of the largest uh, uh, warehouses in all of Puget Sound. So um, I was going to uh, make sure that we understood that our people believed that the Creator provided these salmon and all these foods to us, um, and we needed to thank the forces of nature for, um, as we might call it today, for the, um, for these things. It's much more complicated than that, and I'm not an expert on all that, but there are people, um, other tribes, that have uh, better knowledge of those uh, activities that still go on today. Um, and uh, we're um, super um, thankful for the people who hold on to those traditions. Um, we have um, also know that there, there was a Part of our culture and our history where we talked about the transformer Dokuba, the changer, who changed a lot of the world as we know it today, a um, long, long time ago before time existed, that uh, into what we know today. And a lot of those things were human. So um, a lot of these things, these foods, these fish, these deer were human. And the changer came along and changed them into um, what they became. So we better remember that. Uh, as you've talked about the name of this um, conference, that there is a human dimension to uh, what to the things that we have around us. Um, so when we had our first contact with um, uh, non-natives, was in 1782, uh, when Captain George Vancouver uh, from the British Navy anchored off of Barrage Island, and Chief Seattle was a young boy probably around six years old, and his father went out and traded with him and his crew and uh, actually went over to Blake Island and shot a deer for them, which they're really grateful for because they've been eating a lot of old, dried up meat from England um, for weeks. So um, they were very, very grateful for that. Um, so there was quite a dynamic that went on through that whole voyage between the tribes throughout the sound. And uh, <clears throat> the, um, and the crew there in a lot of the tribes. So anyway, from there, you know, GCL grew up and he became leader of the tribe at a young, a young age, uh, primarily through intertribal warfare and showing leadership through that. And then, uh, then he became a diplomat as more people came to and started to uh, settle here in the Sound. Missionaries and the fur traders were the first. Um, the Hudson's Bay Company, another British concern, uh, established a port in Port Nisqually, and another one up on the Fraser River in the South British Columbia, and Chief Seattle, and Chief Chalicum, another one of our ancestral chiefs, and uh, others would actually provide uh, courier services between the two um, uh, trading posts by canoe. So they were very used to moving up and down um, and traveling in their canoes. And then uh, big, big uh, changes started to come in 1815. The Oregon Trail um, had been established for quite a, quite a while, and more people had got out to Oregon and started to fill up and started heading north, sort of claiming our lands um, under the Donation Land Claim Act. And then uh, Isaac Stevens, who was the governor of the Washington Territory, came out and um, negotiated treaties on behalf of the United States. Uh, and uh, that's when our Treaty of Point Elliott was signed and reserved our uh, rights to hunt fish, which weren't uh, adjudicated and realized until the mid 1970s. And uh, then we later um, were um, recognized our rights to shellfish as well um, about 20 years later. So we're very engaged in preserving our uh, um, salmon runs and our water quality and ecosystems all around. All you people are very engaged in working on. And um, we've uh, been working um, super hard on getting culverts replaced around here. Um, and um, also uh, trying to work with industries to provide better buffers on streams. Um, and also
also to uh, have better stormwater treatment, better wastewater treatment, uh, so that we can kind of keep the water you can see out the window here clean for fishermen. Now, of course, salmon recovery has been really, really difficult. Uh, many people in the room have been working on it. I like to recognize Senator Rolfus back here, good friend of the tribes, and has been very um, active and uh, appropriating money to how to reverse some of these uh, trends. So we appreciate that. And uh, Cecilia Gobins here, Toledo, the Northwest Indian Fish Commission. See Cecilia in a lot of meetings, um, doing the same thing. So um, we're not giving up, uh, but there are a lot of challenges. Um, I was talking to my friend from Colville here about the past meeting we had with the uh, with, with timber and tribal leaders. And um, there's a, uh, a uh, agreement called the Timber Fish and Wildlife Agreement that Billy Frank, um, late uh, chairman of the Northwest Indian Fish Commission, helped uh, negotiate where we have a process for implementing um, rules for October harvest that will help salmon and preserve salmon recovery. And we're kind of at a bypass right now, um, impasse, I should say. Um, with with timber, I'm trying to find where the salmon are in the streams because if we have salmon in, define in, everybody, I know we have a lot of biologists in the room, isn't that the big question? Uh, difference of opinion on that, um, then those buffers should be wider on those streams. And we're spending a lot of time on trying to get that right. Uh, I think that uh, we're hoping with the help of uh, Commissioner uh, Franz that we can uh, find a way to um, establish a, a baseline and an example um, for others to follow, um, building upon CFW, building it to be stronger, getting through this uh, challenge so we can start working with other parts of uh, the Washington economy that have impacts on our on our ecosystems, you know, including agriculture, including uh, cities um, and, uh, and, uh, and private property, other private property owners. We try to change our uh, adaptation here to be more salmon friendly. And so um, I do a lot of speaking on this. I recently did a couple of um, speeches on uh, New York and the salmon. Um, you know, the, 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 Southern resident killer whales uh, that are endangered here in a resident here in Blue Sound that actually came in here 20 some years ago and made all our chum salmon over here in Dives Inlet. So um, they didn't really show up for the um, harvest management meeting. They just kind of showed up and decided they were going to get some fish and didn't wait. So uh, anyway, that was a long time ago, but quite exciting for everybody. However, um, when we got on the, was on the Southern Resident Torca Task Force, you know, there was prey, toxics, and vessel traffic were the three things that we were working on. So those are the three things that have been determined to be the biggest threats. So first they need prey, they need food. So we're trying to put more fish in the system. And there's been hatchery investment by the state, hopefully more by the federal government. Um, and we're putting more salmon into the system. Um, so that not only can the orcas have food, but also the tribal fishermen can have food. So we're kind of at the same, um, at the same means. And we also are looking to try to keep our waters clean. And then we also have issues as tribal uh, fishermen with, uh, with vessel traffic as well interrupting our fisheries. So I found that to be an interesting process. And um, that was kind of, you know, we have a, a great strong connection, cultural connection with, uh, with the Southern Resident Killer Whales. And, there's a story you probably heard before about when at Old Man House, um, we had that village there for a long time. And when the reservation was established, the Port Madison Indian Reservation was established under the same treaty that Seattle negotiated, um, he was able to get uh, the reservation established for his people to include that winter house. So um, we went and moved back to that. Not all of our people lived there, but a lot of them came there after that reservation was established. And uh, so when the reservation was allotted into different parcels, um, they uh, kept the old man house for the Indian agent 
and everything else got given to family members. And then a lot of that land was lost through uh, land auctions sponsored by the federal government. Um, so our reservation is not checker hoarded with non natives and Indian lands. Um, and that land that held the old man house was a uh, um, uh, established, uh, I should say, was um, claimed by the United States Army, let's just say that, for a fort. And they moved us off. They never built the fort. And um, then um, after a while, they sold the land off to the uh, real estate developer. And the state of Washington came in and bought an acre that became the Little Manhouse State Park. And after that was established in the 1950s, uh, it was a it's an Indian longhouse park on an Indian reservation owned by the state. So we kind of felt like we should probably own that. So it seemed to make sense, but it was hard. It was hard to convince people. It took about 30 years to convince people that it was a good idea. And finally, it happened in 2005. And so once we became owners, all the archaeological material that had been excavated in about three excavations over the, the, that time became our property. So the Burke Museum at the University of Washington had been holding it for the state parks. And the day that they put it in their hands and bringing it over, uh, local news station was covering the transfer. And I just happened to get on that ferry because I had another meeting in Seattle and I saw the, the vans. I was talking, oh yeah, we'll have to see you over there. And then, they'll, then the skipper got on, he says, heads up, there's a bunch of whales swimming along, um, orca whales swim along the ferry on the port side. So those orcas followed us all the way from Seattle Bay Bridge. And it's become legend now that they were helping us, as we know, uh, we kind of restore our culture. So we try to do what we can to help them restore their whale life too. So i just like to thank you all for doing all the hard work you do um, in uh, this uh, particular industry. I know none of you probably have gotten independently wealthy um, working in uh, correcting our uh, ecosystems, but I know it has a lot of uh, value to us and uh, it's super important to uh, to us in Suquamish and the other tribes around uh, Central Puget Sound and, and also throughout the Northwest, like you said, uh, um, we've got uh, a lot of tribes and other tribes in Northwest Indians and most of us have salmon as part of our culture. A lot of these tribes don't have any access to salmon um, because of the hydroelectric dams that uh, either blocked it off or severely affected their opportunities at harvest. So uh, there's a lot of work to do. Um, and I look forward to that uh, as we go forward and uh, have a great conference. And once again, welcome to Suquamish and Fort Emerton and our, our homeland. And on behalf of our ancestors, our elders, our youth, and our future generations. Oh, this chat, I'm finished. All right. Thank you, Chairman Forsman, for that. Um, I have some bad news for folks that just signed up because Director Cecil is going to speak. Um, he unfortunately sends his regrets. Uh, he had a family emergency, so he asked me to do interpretive dance uh, on his behalf. So if you need a break, you should take it. Just kidding. Um, I should have introduced myself. I'm Jeff Davis. I'm the Director of Conservation Policy at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I'm very, very thankful for uh, all of you attending uh, this really important, from my perspective, conference uh, and all the work that you do uh, every day. And I see a lot of friendly faces that I work with. So big shout out to my de fellow department teammates, um, and uh, some of our elected officials, Senator Rolfus in the back, Representative Lacanoff is here. Uh, so we appreciate uh, the diversity of folks that are here uh, at the conference. And I look forward to some really great conversations uh, at the breakout session, sessions and in the hallways. So um, when Kelly told me he wouldn't be able to make it, I was like, cool. Uh, although I'm introverted, I, I know a lot of words and I like to say them to people. Uh, so I put together just a few slides. Let's see if I can do it. 
I, I, I really appreciate it, Chairman Forsman, especially speaking to that, uh, the change uh, from uh, people to the different components of nature. <laughs> Uh, because I think that's something that we all can really learn from, um, the, the tribal culture of, of being connected with all the components of nature and ecosystems and the respect that they show between all of those different pieces is really inspiring to me. And I'm hoping that it will influence uh, non-tribal culture uh, as we move forward. So hence my title, Reestablishing healthy relationship with nature. Um, in my observations, we kind of have a, a, a culture or a society that operates apart from nature. Uh, and I'm hoping that through this um, conference and future conferences around the social science that we'll figure out together how to um, help people uh, perhaps live their behavioral intentions as actual behaviors. So why do we do what we do? I, I would encourage folks, and I, I don't know if WOVA, I'm not an IT person. You'll find that out pretty quickly if you don't know that already. I don't know if WOVA allows you to like enter in information, but I, I, I would encourage folks like to take each of these questions. I, I just, it, there's only three, uh, three questions and, and answer them for yourself. And if you're open to sharing those with me, I'd be very interested. So, because I'm, these are really just about me, um, not really narcissistic most of the time, uh, but I have the stage and a mic and uh, the ability to put together four slides. Um, so why do we do what we do? For me, these pictures speak a thousand words. This is my family. Um, in fact, my daughter, Raven, is uh, actually in the championship soccer match in Olympia. Uh, and I'm getting text updates saying she's playing very well. Uh, so good luck to Raven. But for me, I come to work every day and what really gets me out of bed when, when things are going really bad <laughs> and they do uh, at times is these spaces and knowing that um, we're working together in a bigger community to try to restore these ecosystems that are connected to our own health and well being and our future uh, on this piece of dirt we call Earth. This is one I, I constantly am, am uh, wrestling with. Like, well, so when I get up and I come to work and I think about my family and I think about the people that I serve, there's just shy of 8 million people in the state of Washington. Um, what, what is it that I'm hoping to accomplish in this? And I put some of these slides up because in, in my mind, it's really about restoring the health of our ecosystems for the critters and the components of nature itself and for future generations that aren't even here yet today. And I have, I don't, Jeff's not here, but I put a fisher on here, for example, like what a tremendous success story. Um, multi-international effort to release fishers back into um, pristine areas in the state of Washington and they're going gangbusters and it's so cool. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go to a fisher release, do it. It's, it can be life-changing. And I have to also put up a pygmy rabbit because you might be dead inside if you really don't appreciate the beauty of a <laughs> tiny pygmy rabbit. Uh, and the challenges that they suffer with wildfire, um, sagebrush loss uh, from conversion and agriculture. Uh, and these critters are, are, are hanging on. And I, I noticed Woodland Park Zoo is up here. And I don't know if Woodland Park Zoo is here yet tonight. Um, but they're a big partner with us in uh, growing and releasing pygmy rabbits back out into their habitats. And we have our fire crew that's working to restore the health of our forests so that we don't lose them in big catastrophic wildfires. I'm hoping that we'll hear a little bit more about that from uh, some of our panelists uh, coming up here. And then this is about salmon. So I had to have a 
juvenile Chinook there uh, on the bottom. We have restoration going on. So I had to show like, hey, this is a estuary, critically important. We lost about 70, 80% of our natural estuaries uh, in the early 1900s from conversion to agriculture. And uh, both uh, the state and the tribes are busting our backsides to um, put that habitat back on the landscape. And uh, I, every September, I it's my weight loss program. Uh, I go stumbling around in the forests of Washington um, in pursuit of just encountering critters like elk. Um, but just seeing this cow elk with you know four calves trailing along is, is pretty inspiring to me. So that's what I hope for. I hope for putting working collectively to put all the pieces of nature back together so that uh, these critters that are components of that nature are healthy and our own human health and well-being is restored. This is the awesome one. I could spend, as Mike knows, probably weeks just talking to myself about this one. Um, what will it take? To me, human dimensions is the key. I feel like we know a lot about fish, about wildlife, about their habitats, um, how to restore those. The big missing piece for me is getting past this tipping point with the broader public so that everyone's doing their own little tiny parts in their own uh, pieces of the world. And they all collectively are, are advocating uh, for the recovery of nature uh, and the protection of that moving forward. And it, I put pictures on here trying to represent everybody. Um, I think sometimes we get stuck in our fishing and hunting worlds, uh, and uh, there's a lot more to what we collectively do uh, than just those opportunities. And it will take, we heard about the forest and fish from Chairman Forsman. It will take large forest industrial landowners working with us. It will take the small forest landowners working with us. It'll take the farmers uh, working with us. And we have a, a bunch of work to do around that in Washington moving forward. So I just wanted to lay that out there for you all. Hopefully uh, you'll take the questions down and uh, I'd love to hear from all of you about uh, why do you do it? What do you hope for? And what do you think it will take uh, moving forward? So with that, we have an amazing panel set up for you uh, to talk really about what, what do salmon mean to each of them? Uh, and what are their hopes and fears moving forward? So if I could maybe have the panel members come up, we have Representative Lacanon and Jared Michael Erickson, Councilman, and Cecilia Gobin, and Irene Martin. So I, I want to introduce real quick uh, Representative Deborah Lacanoff. She represents the 40th district, which is beautiful um, and diverse. Uh, it includes Watkins, Skagit, and San Juan counties. She's the proud mom who fights every day to ensure younger generations, including her daughter, Emma, can continue to flourish. She is inclusive in her decision-making process by listening to stakeholders, citizens, and governmental bodies. You know that from first-hand experience. She is known for her experience and capacity to work with vast parties on vast issues and get the job done. Sworn into the Washington State House of Representatives in January 2019, Representative Lacanoff is the only Native American woman to currently serve in the legislature. With over 20 years of government relations experience, she engages on a variety of issues at the international, federal, tribal, state, and local levels. Thank you for being part of our panel. I think what I'll do is I will introduce each as we, as we go. Uh, and I also want to say that if we have uh, cards and pens on each table, so if you folks have a question that you want to ask, if you just write it down, we'll collect those and at the end, uh, we'll have a Q&A session. Sound good? Wonderful. Look at that. All right. Well, can you guys hear me? Yes. 
Um, I'm going to stand just because I've been driving for three and a half hours and it's a little easier. Do you mind if I stand up quick? Yes. All right. I'll shut my I'll shut my phone off. Here you go. Do you want this one up? So I'll I'll start off. This is much better. I'm Representative Deborah Lacano from the 40th Legislative District. My flip-up name is Hit Jesse. I am Park Lincoln Part L U. And I think uh Kind of myself in here. I'm thinking for um, for my quick conversation. Let me just tell you what that means from a Native American perspective. Um, I'm part Alu from the Southwest side. Thank you. Now, I don't have, now you don't, don't have to hear two of me, which Jeff knows. Hearing two of Deborah can be really scary. I think mean, Cecilia knows that too. <laughs> um, uh, let me start over. My Flicket name is Hit Jesse. I'm part Flicket from Southeast Alaska, I'm part Alley from Southwest Alaska. My Flicket part of me is the salmon people. The Alley side of me is the seal people. Now, many of you have heard me say this joke a little bit, but if you've heard it, just be patient with me. Bring the combination of seal and salmon together to create someone as unique as me can be pretty outstanding for the crew. Uh, the salmon and the seal have relied upon the Salish Sea and the Pacific Northwest for thousands of years. My bloodline goes back seven generations. Hicks to see is those small baby frogs that live up in your tributary areas where the tadpoles grow, where there's cool, cool and clean water, where there's fresh habitat. It's a name that goes back, which talks about that time of change. Once our cool and clear waters are gone, once our habitat is gone, where will my baby frogs live? Where will my name come from? Where were generations of my people's life ways go? Will I become then a shellfish of who I, a shell of who I am? Not a shellfish, but I could. But will I then become a shell of who I am? Only understanding that this place that was passed down from generation to generation to generation since time immemorial of where my people come from, from where my grandmother's lines come from will no longer exist. This is my story of why I fight so hard to protect the environment, to protect the natural resources, to sustain our cultural life ways, to sustain our language, to sustain people who look like me and sound like me. This is who we are as your Native American and your first people of Washington State, your first people of Alaska, your first people of the United States. People often look at me and go, gosh, Jack, you know, you've got such a great education, 20 years of governmental experience, you could go anywhere. You could be a banker. You could be an ambassador. You could do so much. But I chose to live this life because my grandmother passed this name down to me to always give back, to always serve the people you know, to always serve the people you don't know who call this place home. The value in the work that we bring here today is protecting a life way that I've only known. I know of no other way. I know no other way to make decisions in the state legislature other than seven generations. I know no other way of making a decision in the state legislature than thinking beyond my any. I know no other way to think about how my daughter's daughter's daughter is going to carry my click at name. I know no other way than to save those baby frogs. I know no other way to think that my life and all of your lives will be better if we have a healthy salmon in place. I was taught when I came down to the Washington tribe so long ago, as I came from a place where the tide was out, the table was set. I have all five, or as Larry Rossman put it, six species of wild salmon living in my Alaska waters. The kings where I come from, the fat has got to be that thick. It is the richest. The seals are the fattest. There's no I didn't know what the word bioaccumulative, I still can't even say the English word meant to me when I came from Yakutat. My abundance of shellfish was from here, thousands of beaches down. We could go out and dig clams, cockles, eat them right off. We could go and eat the urchins, open them up, eat them right out. We could flush a seal, eat it, make seal oil that night, no problem. When I came to Washington tribes and I talked to my Washington tribal leaders and my elders, I said, where's your salmon? 
Where's the shellfish? We met from First Nations from British Columbia. We said we have to take our shellfish from British Columbia and take them into this area where you, you sit and wait and you give them your bucket of clams and they flush it out and clean it, then they give it back to you. My tribal leader said every river down here in the lower 48, only one river produces all five species of wild salmon, and that's the Skagit. I came from a place where I only knew wild salmon. I had no idea what the word hatchery was. I didn't even know farm fish existed. And I looked to my Washington tribal leaders and I said, Deborah, we're fighting every day to preserve our life ways, to fish, to hunt, and to gather seafoods. We have lost so much in our lifetime in Washington state that every day we come to the table so we may not become a shell of who we are. So our Native American names can stay strong. So our Native American laws can stay strong. So our Native American way of life can stay strong. In the state legislature, that's what breathes life into me. You might not know this, but Jeff probably, poor guy, he's on my speed dial, he's our favorite. I call him all the time. Jeff, I got another idea to save salmon. I got another idea to save salmon. Senator Rolfus, how can we run Washington state with seeds in one hand and salmon eggs in the other. It's about time to make that change. We're gonna find that Washington State is gonna do for the next 12 to 15 years, growth management, address the Growth Management Act and grow because population is growing in Washington State. More and more people are coming here every day. More and more people are traveling through the homelands of Colville, Yakima on the east side. More and more are coming through Snohomish where Cecilia lives. More and more are coming to the Skagit where Tino lives. More and more people are coming. And if we don't address growing Washington State in the way it needs to grow, based on the values of why we call this place home and why the first Washingtonians grew this place home, then we are doing a disservice as state government, local government, and tribal governments if they do not all three collaborate. It's going to take people like you here today, the best scientists, the dads, the moms, the grandmas, the aunties, the state legislators. It's going to take our law enforcement. It's going to take a governor who's willing to say, as the great, and I say this great, Randy Kinley said from Lummi, and a fisherman and an elder, he said, you have healthy salmon. This is your salmon. He's a little salmon. Not a king salmon. He's kind of a chubby salmon, but that's okay. You take a salmon and you look all the way around it. You have a healthy salmon, you have cool and clean water and a healthy habitat and a healthy environment, right? Clean air. Salmon can't live without it. You have a healthy salmon, your social structure is healthy. You're eating good food. People are fishing, people are doing recreational. The tribes are practicing their treaty rights. The tribes are hunting and gathering. They're living their life ways. Social structure is healthy. Economies are healthy, right? You have a cool and healthy environment, you have jobs, you have people that are happy, they want to go to work. You have a strong industry in the salmon industry, you have a salmon industry all the way around. What more do we need in the state of Washington? Education, healthcare, strong economies, jobs, healthy forests, good land management, and governing bodies working together. That's what makes a healthy salmon. A healthy salmon can address climate change. A healthy salmon can address climate change. If we could all put that on the card and send it to my governor, I'd be so proud. I'd be so happy. If there's one message I could give him, governor, we can create renewable energy all we want. We're going to do that. We're going to cut back on energy use. We're going to look at wind energy. We're going to look at finding alternative ways to provide energy for Washington State. We'll be the hub. We'll bring $2 billion out here. We can reduce energy, but if we don't restore the habitat, we don't restore the habitat, we don't provide cold and clean water, then we don't have anything to help reduce the carbon that's needed. It's going to need to run side by side. I'll go back to what I'm supposed to so I can get back to my wonderful friends here. When I met with the House Democratic Caucus in 2018 in our executive conversations, they said, holy smokes, Representative Wakana, I've never heard anyone talk about salmon so much in the House of Representatives. Salmon might be different. In the House, they looked at me and they couldn't believe it. For the first time, salmon became a priority 
in the House of Representatives. Never before has that happened, believe it or not. We are going to need to be able to be advocates. You're going to have to be our young people who stand up and say salmon's important. Because again, remember what Randy said, if you have a healthy salmon, you have a healthy circle all the way around. You plan to run for office, take a look at how you make your decision making because you have some of the best scientists out there and you can create science to create policy and you can make those changes. If you're going to stand and be part of Washington State, remember, come talk to Tino, come talk to me, come talk to Jared, come talk to Cecilia, call the tribes that are around you and share with them what you're learning because it's going to take more than one government to protect Washington State and to grow Washington State where it needs to be. Thank you, Jeff, for having me here today. I hope I didn't talk too much. I'm a little passionate, but it's uh, it's really important because I didn't understand how much Washington tribes have lost when the Senate disappeared until I came to Washington State. 20 years ago. And for me, as serving as a state legislature, I hope I carry all that they taught me and everything my grandma taught me, and I carry my native name and I move it forward. So thanks, Jeff. And I didn't cry. <laughs> Thank you, Representative. Um, there's a lot of truth to the fact that we're one of the smallest Western states and have the second largest human population. So when we talk about those losses, and I, I can only speak from the non-travel perspective, we've got so many challenges, and yet I'm still very hopeful that we have legislators like Representative McKinnock and Senator Rolfus in our state legislature. We have a great con congressional dele delegation that's really working every single day to send us federal policy and federal funding uh, to, to, to fix the decisions and actions that we've taken in the past so that we do have a chance. And it's not an anti-growth thing. It's just that we need to grow in uh, a more nature positive way. So appreciate that passion always. <laughs> and those speed dial calls, um, keep, keep them coming. Uh, next, we have uh, Councilman Jared Michael Erickson. Uh, I, I've only spent a little tiny bit of time uh, with the council. I can just introduce myself. Oh, no. I would, I, if you don't mind, I was going to share. Like, the bio looks a little bit outdated. To it me. is. That's what I was going to say. So. <laughs> but so I've gotten to, I, one, we spent a little bit of time on the phone kind of preparing for this, this panel. And boy, I'm just so thankful. That there's people uh, um, like Councilman Erickson uh, out there that's working. That I'm a wildlife bio, love wildlife people, uh, forced to sometimes work in a fish world. Um, it's slimy, uh, but worth it. But what, what a phenomenal person uh, who comes up and works through the, his fisheries and, and uh, wildlife committees. Um, on behalf of the tribes and works with federal partners, state partners, NGOs, uh, and always shows up and is really articulate um, and is doing just a phenomenal job in, in my observations. Uh, saw him at the Forest and Fish uh, principals meeting and uh, very wise words were spoken there. Uh, and looking forward to hearing uh, your presentation. Thanks, Jeff. No pressure there. Um, so my name is Jerry Michael Erickson. I'm a councilman for the Caldwell Confederated Tribes. I'm our natural resource and uh, fisheries uh, committee chairman. I'm also the vice, former chairman, now vice chairman of the Upper Columbia United Tribes, which is the five tribe coalition in the Upper Columbia. Um, uh, we, Caldwell Tribes has 12 different tribes that represent. You know, it's seen as one tribe now, I guess, from a federation standpoint. I'm Colville, Sinais, and Okanagan. Those are all cross boundary tribes of Canada. Uh, recently, we won our Supreme Court case in Canada. Um, in 1956, they declared us extinct. Uh, we actually had a meeting there a couple of weeks ago um, that I'll tie this conversation into when I'm going into it. But um, 
reestablishing that we weren't extinct. And so now we're working on having um, a meeting. Wanted to rip up the uh, extinction, declar extinction declaration with uh, the prime minister. And I, could, I believe, I don't know if they call them prime ministers also for the province. I can't, that's really, they referred both of them as prime ministers. So I'm not positive, but they're familiar as much with Canadian uh, um, legislation and stuff. So, but we had a meeting up there a couple weeks ago, and it just shows you the amount of habitat available in Upper Columbia. So we started talking about salmon. You know, all, all of our respective tribes in this side of state all have these issues. Um, talking to Jeff, a lot of these the people for WFW understand that um, a lot of us in Upper Columbia haven't had salmon for 80 to 100 years. So, you know, a lot of these tribes are fighting for salmon. Well, a lot of us have, don't even have access to salmon. Us at Caldwell, we are a little bit, I'd say a little bit lucky. Um, do the PFMC, the Pacific Fisheries Marine Council, we do have an allocation of salmon. We, I do participate in that. Um, and so we have to go below Chief Joseph Dam, which is the first blockage of dams. Originally it was Grand Coulee, and then Chief Joseph Dam was built later on, and now that blocks uh, Nadrimus Fish to the Upper Columbia. So I, I can talk about this for days, but we had <laughs> so much work I do, and there's so many different moving parts. I work with the federal. The federal part, and so WFW has been great recently with the allocation of funding that they approved um, for three million for starting our phase two impl implementation plan um, in the Upper Columbia. You guys can look it up if you want. It's a lot of detail to go into. Roughly, we're trying to chip away at the phase two is going to cost roughly about 171 million. So three million it seems like a lot of money until you look at that big picture. And that's, I mean, we start looking at the what um, BPA or Bonneville gets from the uh, power produced at Grand Coulee Dam, it's really a drop in the bucket when it comes to funding something like this. So we're working on Nazareth fish reintroduction. Recently, last week, they actually released some juveniles um, at Grand Coulee and Chief Joseph is coming this week. Hopefully I can make that out of the meetings too, but release some more juveniles. We had juvenile production actually from the adults released in the sample above their Columbia, which are pit tagged in our screw trap. They caught, um, I think 1,400. So we'll see how those go move through the system and then how these ones move through the system. We'll work on um, acoustic receivers. So we'll receive our adults when these ones come back, which side of the dams they're moving towards. So we can work towards, you know, some sort of fish passage, which in the interim may be whoosh or truck and hauls we're thinking around the doing. Um, I guess I should give a little more background because I'm going into a lot of detail about other stuff. I am a wildlife biologist before I was a tribal councilman. I went into as fisheries. Um, as an intern, I was a tech before I was an intern. I was got tired of this. I don't want to sound bad, but you know, be offensive to any non tribal people here. But as a tribal member, I have a lot of traditional ecological knowledge, but I've been trying to incorporate a lot of the TFW stuff and trying to incorporate a lot of stuff that we do. Tribes, I just know a lot of things that I've known just growing up just because it's passed down to me. And I went to school as a formality because I worked under a non-tribal biologist who one he tried to even kill I guess in a sense he brought me across the San Paul River in the spring and I didn't have a choice in the matter at the time and after that I just kind of told him like this is it I gotta go back to school and not follow if these are people that are leading me I just not, we're not going a good route here so I went back I went to Eastern Washington University because they wanted me to go through that program I wish I could have gone to Oregon State or a different program but anyways I got my degree um it took me a while I drove back and forth two hours Two hours there, two hours back from my house in Grand Coulee Dam, Spokane every day. So I started having kids. I have uh, three kids, a daughter, Reese, uh, she's nine, a son, my second son, Canyon, he's seven, and uh, my youngest is five. Like, so I'm very busy. I know I'm probably look, not much older than a lot of you, but I'm, I have three kids and I'm 35. So I have a little bit of life experience, even though I may not look like it. So back to the Upper Columbia stuff and going into tonight stuff. So when you go up there into Canada, you see the potential of the Upper Columbia. You, you, you always look at it as this imaginary line of, above Grand Coulee. There's a certain amount of habitat available for salmon, um, which there is. There's a lot of habitat available above Grand Coulee in particular. But you get up into Canada, and it's just it seems like it's endless. You get like I don't know if you guys are familiar, maybe not with Lake Soyuz on the Okanagan and the Sockeye Run that we have there. Well, there's Sloping Lake up in uh, uh, Snipes territory on the um, um, Columbia there, and it. Um, it's just it, you look at it and it just screams potential for a sockeye run. I mean, not just sockeye, but a lot of salmon potential. And you just look at all the water up in Canada, it's nuts and right, it's cool water. So, we're talking about climate change and all these things. You try to look at 
where are we, where are we going to be with Sam? Where are they still going to be? Where are they functional? Because in the Okanagan, we have an issue with the sockeye run that they can't even run up the Okanagan because it gets too hot most years. Like last year, we had to work with the ONA, Okanagan Nation Alliance up in Canada to actually get their uh, brood because they couldn't even go, they couldn't even swim the Okanagan. It's too hot. So that's, that's a real, real thing, and especially in East Washington. Maybe not as much over here, but you guys probably aren't far behind us when it comes to it. Um, so we did that and actually just had a call for natural resources director. Some of you know Cody Dizitel, who's helped me a lot. And being where I'm at, he's very knowledgeable and helped me from better counseling, I think. But um, they had a conversation of how they're going to work on that and actually having plans moving forward to do that just to get groups. We want to make sure they're returning back every year. Um, I'm trying to think. We probably just should maybe stop talking. I, there's a lot we have going on and that I want to talk. And I, I figure you guys are going to have questions on some things that we're doing. I hope there are, because I probably get to elaborate more on um, things that call those things. We have 39 million acres that we have traditional territories in the eastern Washington. So we cover a lot of ground. We, I know a lot of these tribes have maybe some smaller area than, um, but ultimate goal we're trying to do with the Columbia is get more fish back in the system to help the orca and help everyone. More fish in the Columbia takes pressure off everyone's uh, stocks of fish. And so that's what we're trying to work on, the ultimate goal in Columbia. And yeah, it's a, uh, Bunch of meetings, and here I am trying to get more support for it. So that's why I'm here. I mean, and I think it helps to get anywhere you can go. And so I try to be really in place. Like I was just over here, and then I'm back home because I try to be with my family as much as I can be home. Then I'm back over here, and hopefully it's a few more weeks where I got to come back over. No offense to you guys. <laughs> I like the other side of the state. I'm more on this bias, but thank you guys. If you have any questions, I'm sure we can answer. Yeah, so this panel, as you all know, is about salmon. Um, but if you're thinking of questions and writing them down, uh, Chairman Erickson is like working on forest health, uh, working on wolves. Like oh. they, they, they're doing a bunch of work. Talk more about that. <laughs> they're doing a bunch of work because uh, this is this is as you probably are all aware. This is a wildlife conference as well. So. Uh, connect with him for sure and uh, learn more about the holistic management that the Yukons are doing. I just put more things on wildlife benefits. Yeah, go ahead. So just real quick, because there's some good things we're doing. I'm sorry, I don't want to take more time. But actually, this morning, one of our biologists that I work with prior, we do wolf collaring, right? And so he just he sent a picture of a new pack that they collar on our side of the state. Um, so we just this winter we did links for introduction. So we talked we talked about the fisher. So we just did that. I mean, I know there's been some in the Okanagan, there's still some residential ones here and there, but we just did reintroduction of links. We're gonna say five year, 10 links a year is the ultimate goal working with the ONA trappers to reestablish links in the kettle, kettle of crests in particular. Um so I, I when I, I grew up, I hunt all the time. Like Jeff talked about, I I help in September, I have hounds, and so Try to believe we can still use hounds. So I, I catch cougars, bears, bobcats, been bit by a pair. I mean, you knew I've done it. Like my kids grow up. We talk about, he has slides about talking about kids and who you do it for, how, why you do it. And, you know, my kids grow up and I'm I'm skinning a bobcat from a, so it's too cold in my shop where I'm on my side. I say, so I'm skinning them from a light chandelier. My kids get used to me skinning a bobcat from a light chandelier in my house. So they grow up seeing these things. So I want to be able to talk about salmon and those and they need to make sure they're here on the landscape for the future generations and so like seven generations for like she's uh like she mentioned that we're always living as indian people so i just those are a couple more things i just they happen to catch one this morning for a wolf once so i wanted to agree you know just tell you guys some of the things we've got going on call for this more than that but sorry jeff no All right, our next panelist is Cecilia Govin. Uh, she is a conservation policy analyst with the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and represents tribes on the commission. Her work is focused on supporting the tribes and the protection of tribal treaty rights and resources and covers areas such as the Endangered Species Act, Puget Sound Salmon Recovery and Recovery Planning, as well as working on various habitat protection issues with particular focus on the nearshore and shoreline environment. Cecilia also brings along a strong understanding and familiarity with the Puget Sound National Estuary Program, or PISNER as we call it locally, as well as various tribal programs and habitat initiatives 
and has extensive experience and understanding of tribal treaty rights. I'll say um, Cecilia is, um, I, I don't have favorites, but she's one of my favorites to work with on habitat issues, especially uh, in the Puget Sound. And um, she's maybe, I don't want to jinx her, but she may be one of the most dynamic uh, speakers. If you ever catch her stories, she's just inspiring. And so I, I'm thankful that she was willing to be a part of this panel because I think we can all learn a lot um, from, from Cecilia. So, Cecilia. Uh, thank you, Jeff, uh, for the kind remarks and the introduction. Osiam Tsitsia Tsitsiaia, Zadzak Tsitsa, and he is the whole child. Ati Gwati do Slayla Alza Tavi. Oiti Gutsid Ati as Alza Tavi, Hoiti Gwati Sast Hilp Chaf Ati Ayayus. Good afternoon, my friends and relatives, respected leaders and guests. My name is Cecilia Gobin. My hereditary name is Zadzala, and I'm a Tulalip tribal member, and I descend from the Stahobsh, the Snohomish people. I wanted to offer first a round of thanks to Jeff and your agency, to the partner, Colorado State University, for the invitation to speak here today. And also a thanks to all of you who gathered here today to just support and uphold one another, just help trust to uphold one another in the work that we do together. As introduced, um, my day job is a policy analyst for the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, but I was born and raised in Tulalip. I grew up as a commercial fisher. And um, if there were more fish out there today, I would probably still be on the boat as opposed to uh, behind the desk. But um, I watched my parents and grandparents work in this field long before me through the treaty rights, the boat decision. And it was uh, a path that they had put me on to help continue this work as well. Some of the speakers before me spoke a little bit more technical in nature, but my remarks here today will be more personal and reflect a little bit about my own interaction, my own story with salmon and this place. I get asked what salmon means to me a lot, probably because of two reasons. The first being my line of work, working for the 20 treaty tribes of Western Washington, but the second probably because of who I am and where I come from. Before coming to work, at the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission before being asked to attend conferences such as these. I am and I always will be first and foremost an indigenous Coast Salish Stahobsh Tulalip tribal member. My first introduction to salmon, to its importance in my life and in the life of my family and of my people was not something that I read about in books nor was it something that I studied in college or a random hobby. My first introduction, my first instructions came at a young age in my life, as a young child at two years old, being brought around the longhouse, sitting with elders in their care and instruction to learn the teachings, the songs, the dances, the prayers that are part of what we call the first salmon ceremony the return of Heksia Biovac. It's first food ceremony, it is a first food ceremony held by tribes and First Nations all throughout the Pacific Northwest that gives thanks and acknowledgement to the first returning king salmon of that year. This ceremony at Tulalip was nearly lost as it was for many tribes and First Nations due to the various assimilation policies of the US and Canadian governments that banned our ceremonial life ways and spiritual practices. In 1976 at Tulalip, the first salmon ceremony was held 
after decades of dormancy. And I say dormancy because while many anthropologists and ethnographers would classify such a drop in practice for decades as something that was, quote, lost, these practices were not lost. They have been tightly held by our elders until the time was right that they be brought back out again. And after sitting for hours with elders and from Tulalip and neighboring tribes, songs started to be remembered, ceremonial protocol remembered, prayer songs and dances remembered and brought back together, brought back to the people and to the salmon. As a Coast Salish woman, as Coast Salish people, our lives have always been interdependent on one another, the salmon and the people. This kinship, this relationship is one that has always been respected and protected. Since time immemorial, my ancestors have fought and protected the salmon and these resources because salmon have always fought for and protected us. They've always come home to sustain our needs in return for us, the people, taking care of them. The first salmon ceremony in particular is the embodiment of this relationship that exists between the people of the land, you and I, and the salmon people. We take care of them, of their homes, of the beaches, of the bays, of the estuaries, of the rivers. And in return, they come home every year to us to sustain the needs of our people. And so when I think about salmon and what it means to me, I first think of resilience. I think about the resilience of my people to ensure these resources for future generations, of their resilience in the face of outright discrimination to restore our ceremonial and spiritual ways of life that teach us, that teach me the importance of and the responsibility to these resources, to the salmon, to the land and to the water. And I think about the strength and the resiliency of salmon that continue to make their way home to us despite the drastic and devastating habitat loss and destruction that has occurred in the last 200 years. And their resiliency to have waited all this time for us to get it right, to turn the tide for salmon. People ask me about salmon and what it means to me and I'm immediately transported back home. I'm on a boat or at the beach, setting a net, sharing in work and laughter and teachings with my siblings and with my parents and my grandparents. I grew up fishing. Even before I could be put to work, my dad would bring us out just to be around it, to learn, to listen, to observe, and once we were old enough and able enough, we were fishing alongside him. You see, I can't think about salmon without thinking about being home because to me, the two are synonymous with each other. Fishing, the water, the land, it's all about home and the relationships that we have to each other, to the land and to the water. It's this power of place of what the land and the water provide us that weaves the bond of family and communities together indelibly. Our very existence is rooted in this place, grounded in these landscapes and in these waters. And we're defined by all of these things, our relationship between the plants, the animals, and the people. And it's why our work to protect these things and to restore them, to restore our connection to them, remains imperative because we know that when they are healthy and when they are flourishing and when our salmon are not merely surviving or recovered but are thriving, then so too are our communities, so too are our homes and our families. It's been a little over 20 years since we made the decision to embark on salmon recovery in the Washington Way from the ground up, watershed to watershed. And still, after all this time, we're asking ourselves the same question. 
What do we need to do to recover salmon? What do we need to do to reverse the population decline? The quick answer in sum is simple. We have to do it all and we have to be doing it better. The long answer, however, is this, is that we already know what we have to be doing. We've already written the recovery plans. We've already written the resource management plans. And we have most, though not all in some need advising, the laws and regulatory framework to protect salmon, to protect water quality and quantity, to protect and restore habitat and to improve our land use practices. We just need to start doing it and doing it better. Because if there's anything that the current state of salmon and the orca and the fact that habitat restoration is still being outpaced by habitat loss can tell us it is this, that we have a long road ahead of us and there's a lot of work yet to be done and that our solutions are not going to be easy or quick fixes. And it's gonna be challenging because it requires us to change not just in ourselves and in our daily walks of life, but it will be challenging because it requires us to change radically how we do business in this state. It means depoliticizing salmon and decolonizing the landscape physically and politically because what's good for salmon is good for the people. We wanna leave this world better than we found it, to leave a place worthy of our children and our grandchildren and to have our families taken care of. And we know that when we take care of this place and when our salmon are thriving and when our waters are clean and healthy, our communities are healthy. Doing salmon recovery better also means holding one another accountable. We know what it'll take to recover salmon. We know what the habitat needs are. We know what rules and regulations need to be in place. And so we must just be advocating for these things together, collectively. It also means saying the hard things and having the tough conversations and telling people no and holding polluters accountable. And it means changing the way that we think about salmon and our shorelines and our waters and our resources and our land use and development practices. We have to cultivate the political will to move beyond the business as usual approach because we know that that's not work for our salmon or our watersheds. And it means viewing these resources as gifts, as a responsibility entrusted to us to view them and to view them as part of the constituency, just as much as you and I are. Some of you have heard me say this before, but it bears repeating. I do not want to know a future without salmon, a life without salmon. And it's easy given the current persistent state of things to feel as though we are on that path to know extinction of salmon within our lifetime. And to be honest, we probably will if things do not change, if we do not drastically change the urgency of our approach. People often talk about hope what gives us hope to continue this work? What gives us hope for the future of salmon? But hope alone won't save our salmon. And I do not have hope so much as I have steadfast determination and passion and commitment to fulfill the responsibilities left to me by my ancestors, to steward these resources for future generations, to protect them and to recover them. Can we and should we be optimistic? Absolutely. And hope plays a role, a role in maintaining that outlook. But it will not carry us, nor will it determine whether we are successful or not. Success is not determined by how much hope one holds. Rather, it's determined almost exclusively by hard work, dedication, commitment, and persistence and the ability to change and learn and grow when something is no longer working for us, when it's no longer fueling our success. Whether or not we will recover salmon, whether we will continue to know a life with salmon, 
rests solely on how committed we stay to this work, how well we hold one another accountable, how well we encourage and push one another forward to do the right thing, to take charge and to lead, to find the political will to tackle hard issues, to say no to permitted habitat destruction to polluters and to say no to extractive and pollution-based economies and practices. Life without salmon? That's a question that's hard for me to speak to here today. And it's a question that I do not have an answer to because it's simply not an option for me. We cannot lose the salmon. We will not lose the salmon. My great great grandmother used to ask some of her kids when they would be dealing with difficulties this question What are you going to do when the really hard times come? Sit around and feel sorry for yourself? You have to get up and you have to keep going. Well, these are our hard times. So, what are we going to do? This is up to us together. Nobody else can do this work for us. This is our destiny, and this is our future, and we must step up together and carry out this work. We have to elevate ourselves to new levels, to, out, to think outside the box and to be bold. If we were serious when we said extinction is not an option when it comes to salmon, and if we're serious about having a future and a home where salmon once again run in abundance, then this is what is required of us. Once again, I want to thank you all for the invitation to be with you this afternoon, Jeff. Um, again, thank you for thinking of me and including me in this. Thank you. I feel like taking this mic and just Throwing it on the stage. <laughs> wow. Every time she gets me. Um, we have certainly last but not least in any regards, if I could adopt a second mother, <laughs> it, it would be Irene Martin. Um, she, Irene is an award-winning author, uh, and she specialized in the Lower Columbia fisheries for over 40 years. Her husband, Kent, who's here with us in the back there, is fourth generation of Columbia River Gilna. They have fished together in Alaska, the Columbia, and the Willow Bay. Her most recent book is The Flight of the Bumblebee. The Columbia River Packers Association and a Century in the Pursuit of Fish Irene is currently working on another book, not surprising to me. The Incoming Tide of Memory, A History of Salmon Canneries of the Columbia River. An exhibit she created, Legacy of the Columbia River Fishery, incorporated her knowledge of Columbia River fisheries and images and artifacts from a number of collections, including that of her husband, Ken. The exhibit was awarded the David Douglas Medal from the Washington State Historical Society in 2013. Among other awards, she has received the James B. Castles Heritage Award, Washington State Historical Society Center for the Columbia River History in 1998, and the Washington State Governor's Heritage Award in 2000. Um, I'm so excited that Irene is here, uh, and I can't wait to hear her words. She's perhaps one of the most uh, detailed <laughs> uh, researchers that I've ever met. And if anyone really understands truly the big picture of everything that we are and what we're about, it's Irene Martin. So Irene, please. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Always the shortest speaker. <laughs> My husband is going to be passing around an artifact I brought with me. It's a piece of trench art from World War I. It's a paper knife, and it is marked with the name Ypres, Y-P-R-E-S, which uh, was a little town in Belgium. 
And now that I've given you that much information, I'm going to talk about something else. And we'll get back to Eber later on. The theme of this year's Pathways Conference is Life Without Salmon. As you have been told by Jeff, my husband is a Columbia River Gillander, fourth generation. And it's hard to think in terms of what kind of communities we all form. But the community of the Columbia River Gillnet fishermen has been experiencing life with a lot fewer salmon and is looking ahead to life without salmon. So I want to talk for a moment about communities. In this case, there are two communities at work. One is the occupational community, as anthropologists would call, and the other is the communities themselves where fishermen live. Among other things, I uh, was inveigled into becoming an Episcopal priest over the long years. And one of the things that propelled me into the kind of research that I started doing was that I was burying people who were dying before their time. So, and this, there were mainly fishermen. So in 2005, I began documenting Columbia River fishing community statistics to better understand the social makeup of the Columbia River Gilnet Fleet communities. And I'll summarize my findings. Over two thirds of licensed Columbia River Gilnetters lived in four lower river counties, Okayakum, Pacific and Grays, Harbor County in Washington, Clatsop County in Oregon. And the remainder lived along the river or in scattered locales throughout the two states and Alaska. At that time, the Columbia River commercial fishing business depended on a Columbia River Gillnet permit, plus a portfolio of other permits from several states, Washington, Oregon, and particularly Alaska. And those permits weren't necessarily permits for salmon. They might be permits for shrimping, crabbing, digging razor clams, trolling. The money from those other endeavors returned to the Columbia River where fishermen lived. Multiple permits reduced risk and provided options in case a particular fishery was not viable in any year. The income brought in by these three business, by these businesses came to an area with significant negative social statistics and community health statistics due to high poverty rates. The four counties all ranked in the lowest per capita field, income field, according to the U.S. Census of 2000. Mortality rates were also significantly higher than state rates. Other indicators such as adult and juvenile alcohol violations, child abuse, drug use, and adolescent suicide rates were all higher than corresponding state rates, sometimes double or triple. The average, the death of the age of death of fishermen in Wakayakin County averaged 65. 10 years younger than the average age of death of the US white male. And that began to make me realize why I was very in so many fishermen. Community issues in 2005 included reduction in incomes, lack of fishing time, uncertainty over the future, and community instability due to ESA listings of salmonids and declining runs. Fishermen cited increased allocation of fish to the recreational sector, which downgraded Columbia River permit values, and lack of understanding of the needs and problems of, urban, of rural areas by a largely urban-focused uh, fishing population as reasons to reconsider their commitment to the Columbia River fishery and the, its communities. Now let me update you a little further. My most recent documentation, because I keep tracking this over the years, the three Washington counties that I've already cited still have income levels you know, below the state per capita, and they still have higher poverty rates than the state rates. The Washington rate for poverty is 10.3%. Okayakum County was 10.9%, Pacific County 15.4%, Grace Harbor County 17.3%, third highest in the state. Recent numbers show that fishing workers also are part of the Deadliest occupation in the United States, 145 deaths per 100,000. We are top of the list in terms of dangerous occupations. And a 2016 report showed that life expectancy in the 19th, 19th district 
where the majority of fishermen live was shorter than the state life expectancy. So that gives you a picture of what, what life with declining runs of salmon starts looking like. The three speakers who have gone before me are all determined to turn that around, and I thank them. But what I'm trying to say is the option is what we are living right now, and it's grim, and I don't want to see it go any further. We have to change this, not only for the people where I am, but for people everywhere, so we do not see communities all over the state looking like ours. In 2012, the Washington Fish and Wildlife Commission developed policy C3620 to reallocate main stem salmon to the recreational fishery and move the gillnet fleet to side channels. These, there were dramatic changes in the incomes for fishermen. They plummeted on the Columbia River, and Grays Harbor County still has the state's, now has the state's third highest poverty level and showed a steep drop in fishing participation and which made their uh, plight even worse. So the policy basically failed these communities. The problem with it is that that's as far as the analysis goes. Yes, we know the policy failed these communities, but what people don't look at is the larger dynamics of what are these people going to do. So I looked at a study from Alaska that showed that local permit or ownership creates an opportunity for fishery earnings to be spent locally on goods and services. In addition, addition to hiring local crew members who in turn are also more likely to spend their earnings locally. The study found that local commercial fishing permit owners had a significant positive effect on their local economies. And the place of resident of a fisher achieved benefits that are not achieved in the place where the fishery actually took place. So to retain Columbia River permits in the Columbia River area, you not only have to have the portfolio permits, but you have to have a local fishery as well, where people live. What I have to report now is what I'm observing among the people I know. A lot of people are leaving the Columbia because of what is going on. And the money that they brought in to those communities already impoverished is going to go elsewhere. And that exodus of those fishermen is now well underway. We said goodbye this past week to yet another family that we were friends with. They've gone to Alaska. Now systems theory tells us that systems have buffers built in that provide protection support and resilience in case something goes wrong. Buffers may change depending upon different circumstances. For example, up until 1952, the Bristol Bay Gillnet fishery was required to fish with sailboats as a form of conservation by inefficiency. It also meant that a lot of people died around Bristol Bay. Mechanization saved lives, but it changed the buffer system and a new buffer limited entry developed to create a more effective fleet and provide conservation. On the Hub Columbia, the hatchery system might be considered as a buffer, which was created to offset salmon depletion caused by habitat issues, particularly dams. Fishermen also developed their own buffers. On the Columbia, one such buffer was the drift right. To prevent damage to their nets from debris on the river bottom, Fishermen banded together in groups known as snag unions to spread the labor and cost of pulling snags. Those who participated in that work had what was called a drift right. Now, fishermen were fiercely competitive while fishing, but on the Columbia, they learned to overlook that, those animosities to band together to maintain their fishing grounds and to ensure equity of access, which was a very strong egalitarian value. They developed rules to govern such issues as sale of a drift right or drawing lots for when individuals could lay out a net and where. Gillmanders of different ethnic origins, politics, religions, and languages compromised and cooperated as a unit to maintain access to the resource. Other buffers in the fishermen's toolbox included 
employing family members as crew. Many fishers' intention was to pass the fishery along as an inheritance and a form of wealth. This family-based buffer fosters long-term thinking and organizes relationships that provide for the future with permit portfolios as buffers and strong advocacy on environmental issues. The fishermen created a culture of memory that they started passing through from generation to generation. And the values that they passed on that came up as a result, perhaps, of their fishing behavior were long-term thinking, advocacy is important, community is important, willingness to work together, equity of access. But when all the buffers are taken out of the system, resilience evaporates, which is the situation we are now in on the Columbia. What I see going on is that the norms of long-term thinking and organic relationships among family and kin that were intended to provide for the future have been overrun by the constant change in regulation, fish runs, and basically almost everything that comes our way at this point. The numbers that I cited really indicate to me that state agencies are working at cross purposes and exacerbating conflict, which will get us nowhere with fish recovery. To revive these communities, state policies must consider urban and rural, rural communities' roles and needs. The two will not necessarily provide the same thing towards salmon recovery. Restrictions on land, timber, and fisheries in rural coastal counties in the name of salmon recovery so far have ironically left these counties out of any economic feedback benefits from recovery, except for tourism and recreation. And foster a view on point that recreation and tourism is the only morally acceptable use of natural resources. Tourism in our communities has become a form of monocropping, forcing communities to rely on one economic source that may not support families or communities. And as the law of unintended consequences arises once again, salmon habitat and rural landscapes is now being sold for development to many of those same visitors who come for tourism and recreation. COVID-19 exacerbated this trend in our particular area because it made it feasible for, to work from home, wherever home happened to be, or who wouldn't like to be out in beautiful habitat, working with a five acre plot that is maybe given over to a couple of houses and outbuildings and so forth. And bit by bit, the salmon habitat is getting whittled away by this. Now, I want to touch a little bit on the it, the knife that I'm passing around, it's a paper knife in brass, it's called trench art. It's made in World War I. And I had an uncle that fought in World War I in the trenches, and I had a great uncle that fought in World War I in the trenches at a place called Ypres. Trench warfare basically is a type of work where we really don't think very much about. But I do think that it's important for us to recognize that behind some of the problems we're facing are what I think of as fish wars, whereby recreational, commercial, tribal participants and agencies are all caught up in this battle of who is going to get the fish. My uncle and my great uncle fought in the trenches in World War I. That was a time when trench warfare had reached its peak. They allied in the Axis, Axis forces, each had trenches dug near Ypres in Belgium. They fought, fought back and forth, trying to gain more land. And the land between the trenches was called no man's land. After three years of fighting, the three battles of Ypres, some three million people were dead. There is still no accurate account of the wounded or maimed. Weapons such as poison gas were tried for the first time. My great uncle, was in one of those attacks and coughed for the rest of his life. My uncle suffered from PTSD for the rest of his life from the horrors of that trench warfare. 
The Allied forces gained 300 meters of ground. Three million people dead. No count on the wounded and maimed or the people at home that lost loved ones. 300 meters of ground. Parts of no man's land are still closed to public entry due to contamination from over 100 years ago. Trench warfare over salmon is what we have been fighting for so many years, whether recreational, commercial, tribal, interagency. And I think it's like Ypres, the stories I heard in my family, a little bit about the trench warfare, no one talked very much about it. But they did talk once in a while, and I listened. The question I ask you, in looking at the struggles that all of us have been involved with, whether we want it to be or not, is can salmon swim through no man's land? That poisoned piece of earth that a lot of our rivers are becoming, that we need to focus on in terms of habitat and restoration. Ask yourself, can salmon swim through no man's land? Would they and we be better off if this ceaseless trench warfare of who will get the most fish finally ends and we start the rebuilding that inevitably follows warfare? What we are seeing in community life without salmon should be a warning to everybody. It entails poverty, negative social statistics, and loss of the very habitat that salmon need to thrive. Long-term thinking, advocacy, community efforts, willingness to work together, equity of access. These are the values that help salmon and salmon recovery and promote environmental justice so that no one bears a disproportionate burden in the conservation and recovery process. Loss of salmon leads to poverty. It destroys community resilience, leading to desperate people selling their land, which may be salmon habitat, for development. Salmon will not survive this, let alone thrive. Trench warfare is obsolete thinking and must end. Those who will not learn from history are forced to repeat it, and I think that is where we are now. So let's turn for more to salmon recovery. As a story of fish processor, Steve Fick put it, if we are to sustain and recover salmon, a connection must continue to exist with those affected by their existence and expand to the rest of society. We all need to understand the indirect connections healthy ecosystems bring to us all. The commercial fishery contribution that my husband and I have talked about many times is the concept of abundance. We think in terms of scarcity a lot about salmon. But those of us who have gone to Bristol Bay and fished, as I've been lucky enough to do, I've seen abundance. And that's the memory that a lot of the gillnetters bring back with them year after year after year when they go to Alaska to fish. You see runs of tens of millions of fish. You see habitat that is absolutely the way it was hundreds of years ago. You see abundance of everything, mosquitoes, water, tundra, and you see abundance of fish. Once it was like that here. The oral tradition of remedial letters, their long-term thinking, the advocacy our forebears did was to support abundance. We will see proof that abundance is coming back and viable fisheries are coming back at some point, and we need to be on the lookout for it. But we also need that collective memory of what abundance looks like in the first place. And that's what we should be striving for, not show and tell runs, not, okay, well, we can sacrifice those three creeks over there, but we'll really focus on this one. We need to be thinking in abundance. What did salmon do? that created such abundance, and how do we get to that? Thank you very much.
uh, difficult days uh, in my career was calling up Irene, who uh, I don't know what it is in the state. In growth management, it says that growth management is supposed to protect our fishing industry. And uh, I don't know why uh, it says that about forest industry and agriculture. And fishing industry is just the one that just seems to not have really been protected uh, in my observations. But getting back to one of my saddest days is talking to Irene, who always, whenever I picked up the phone and called uh, and said, Irene, I need help on Habitat. She was always there. She wrote the darn Lower Columbia Salmon Recovery Plan. She was in, in the conversations and in the writing and was always there, except the one time when she had to tell me, Jeff, I got to fight for my industry. We're going away. And if I can hang on to it, I'll come back and help you on Habitat. I think that might be the last time I talked to Irene on that phone because I didn't. I knew she was in a slog, uh, in a battle, in the trench, and um, I knew that I, I hoped that someday that she would come back and help us on the Habitat piece. So we got our marching orders to make it so. Okay. Sorry, habitat's a little important component of my life. Um, oh, so we have a bunch of questions that folks wrote down. I saw folks up here writing questions down, maybe two. Well, here's a here's one um, for anyone that wants to take it. <laughs> what is the most important short-term and long-term action you think we need to start on right now? Yeah, I'm biased, I guess. So the Upper Columbia, I believe, is the biggest issue because all the habitat available. We're talking about habitat and what production can be. It's in the millions of fish returning back into the system. And those fish go all the way up to Alaska, on the coast. Um, personally, that, again, I'm biased because I'm in the Upper Columbia, right? But all those fish got to go past Irene and all the Lower Columbia on the coast for commercial fishermen. Um, these aren't just... Columbia, quote unquote, river fish, these are, you know, for everybody. And so to her point, I've been working on trying to get everyone together, all the tribes have been doing that for 18. I have Camp Brigham, Shannon Wheeler, uh, the tribal perspective, but I've made several points in those meetings that we need to get the commercial and sports fishermen on the same side as us. Because we're all trying to get salmon back, right? We're not, it's not us against them. And it's not about allocation anymore. It's about making sure we're not having what they call us the sixth great, great extinction. We're kind of Kind of in right now, so make sure we're not we're not losing any uh, species of salmon. Because I don't think any of us on our clock want to see that happen. Um, and we get our allocation called well, ironically, on the same side as commercial and sports fishermen. We don't get our allocation of salmon on the treaty side because we are we're not a treaty tribe. Our tribes are not a treaty tribe. We're quote unquote executive order tribes, which is hard to get a history lesson. But we never extinguished any of our rights. We never gave up anything ever gave up period and so we're on a different then it's hard because most a lot of tribes in the state are treaty tribes so they'll talk about treaty rights and this and that we do have treaty rights we do have rights um, they're just different and hard to talk about in a sense but that's what i think the biggest issue is getting fish back in there for columbia and columbia in general is only about half of the columbia systems utilized for salmon right now so we keep trying to put more money into something that you get only a certain amount of fish to we'll say we'll expand that and that's why i work with the feds a lot of that is in state stuff they've been helping great with Stuff that they can do um, funding wise, but um, like a lot of that goes to those dams or federal dams, Army Corps and Bureau of Rec. So, sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, as a state legislator, I would think that uh, I think bringing tribal, local, state governments together, both scientifically, politically, budget wise, needs to be an investment for our state. I look to my great friend sitting with me here today. The state legislature needs to realize that salmon recovery and conservation. Is vital right now. It brings in $3.1 billion to the state of Washington. It's not just an economic driver, it's a way of life. I think whether it's a treaty right or it's a non treaty right, that's beyond the point. 
legally though, uh, treaty rights, um, I want to recognize that also. But I, I do want to say that um, we have the Growth Management Act happening. And right now we can almost include all when we start including salmon as part of Growth Management Act. When we include net ecological gain, getting habitat back now more than ever at all public, state, and private areas. I think also as a state legislature, investing financially into our agencies, um, incorporating the regulations and the laws that need to be taken forward, and then understanding that it's going to take all governing bodies to be able to work together, not just one government. As co-managers uh, to the bulk decision, the relationship between commercial sport and tribal fishermen, it's no longer um, they, um, it's us. And I, I agree with the councilman that it's going to take all of us to bring it back together. But it's going to take a state legislature making salmon a priority. And it's going to take the governor creating that as a priority in local government. And then we can start moving forward. Thank you for the comments. And I've been on a number of recovery boards over the years. I am utterly convinced that habitat is the issue and that we are losing it extremely rapidly. What troubles me most, I think, is the time that we have lost in the wars that are being fought, have been fought. And we are going to have to find some ways of doing things that normally one would not want to do quickly. Quickly. I in looking at some of the ideas that have been floated, uh, I'm an alternate on the Columbia Basin Collaborative and have been sort of dipping my toe into that part of the recovery sort of mixture throughout our state. I'm struck by the, um, the kinds of daunting processes ahead of us, such as planting buffers along streams, my husband and I planted 29 acres of our own property over the years, uh, well, 22 years ago is when we started it under the PREP program. And we have become not disillusioned with PREP, but have a whole new respect for the kind of timeline it takes to recover habitat. You don't just plant some trees and leave them and figure that it's gonna happen. It takes time. Each stage of a tree's growth has a different effect on the habitat around it. In some cases, you may have to replant three and four times to get those buffers to actually survive. We found that one out the hard way when we planted cedar along the stream bank in the beaver's garden uh, within the first couple of years. Now we plant spruce, which they don't like quite as much. So, but what I'm saying is, this is a learning pro process and you're not going to learn it in the first couple of years. There has to be a long-term commitment of decades to recovering habitat before we're going to do it, because we're dealing with creatures like trees that have long-term lives, and they're different at different stages of their life, and we have to be prepared for the long haul on this. It won't happen in a couple of years. It, silver bullet thinking will not work for recovery. It's going to happen, and I won't live long enough to see it. And that's just fine by me. But I'm hoping that the younger people than I am will live to see it. But it's long term, and you have to focus on that. The idea you could do a project and walk away from it is false. You're going to have to be there. Okay. A couple more. It's six, so I, I don't know, Paul or Emily, what sort of timeline we're on for the social, but I have a couple more. Six thirty. Six thirty. We started by. Okay. So, so is our common conversation habitat in that question? <laughs> I, I do have a bumper sticker still that says "Habitat's the key" uh, in my office. <laughs> With a raccoon on it. I didn't get that selection. <laughs> but um, I, I heard uh, Irene, you speak to the, the principle of scarcity. In, in, in my observations, as I, 
recovering habitat person. Um, it's always been a struggle to see as the populations of salmon decline and that principle of scarcity come in where everyone's battling, as you said, for that, that we just want our share of that last fish. Um, and we, we, as a state person, we've heard that uh, at the North of Falcon table, which is where we negotiate uh, our fisheries, tribal and non-tribal. Can you, can you share with us some thoughts, any, any of you, about how can we overcome that principle of scarcity and instead, how do you re, refocus away from the chasing the last fish into a collective army, if you will, um, that really gets at the political will piece and, uh, and doing the right things and faster and, and furiously uh, uh, restoring and protecting habitat. So you're at the, you're at the DFW meeting we had, and it seems like, I think it's like industry, ag, tribes, it seems like everyone's pretty close on a lot of things, but there's just these few lingering, I think I use the analogy, lingering like bad fart when I was there amongst our little <laughs> thing group. And, um, it's just these little things getting over and it seems like they're, they're kind of, I wouldn't say nitpicking, you know what I mean? Because there are important things when it comes to buffers, the parent area, the habitat, and um, it's different between east and west side, there's a lot of differences. Um, east side can burn up a lot, right? And so. Here, that you know, your fire regime is different over here. One book I just want to recommend to people is Indians, Fire and Land in the Pacific Northwest. It's just something to read on. It talks about all the tribes and how they use fire, how they burn. So, that being said, on, the, on our side, it's, it's uh, uh, we, we want to use fire. We've suppressed it so long that we have a lot of habitat issues. But it just seems like what he was at, Jeff was asking, is there's a lot of things we're so close on, just in that in general for Washington. I, I hope we can get to some conclusions. I know our natural resource. Director Code just tells on the Forest Practice Board. He's he's had uh, he's we've had conversations anyway. They'll just say that there's been some issues that we just it seems like they're so close, but some things just kind of far away too. So just getting past some of those and like figuring out what's you know on the ground, like talking to all of our breakout groups in that meeting, we had it solved, right? Like I worked when I was a wildlife officer and I worked on FPA, I worked well with the forest, the forester on it. And a lot of times they even did upgrades to you know, fish bearing stream with one of the or uh, conservationist people that was in my group was like, have you ever heard of that happening? And I was like, then me and the guy from WFPA, uh, Mark, I his name is, we're like, yeah, I've seen it. You know, and I'm from a tribal perspective, but again, I'm on the east side. So there's, I know there's differences and I know there's a lot more commercial and other things going on over here. I know there's a lot more water, um, but just getting, just finding common ground on some of those things and getting to some conclusions because the longer you sit there and figure and fight, the, the habitat and the species are what hurts, you know? We as humans, we are the human dimension that was talked about in pathways, and we're just got to come to some agreements on some things. And on the ground, people sometimes are the best for that. But. Well, I guess the representative told me to speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess along those lines, um, you know, I I tend to think more big picture. Um, I, like I mentioned before, I, I come from a family that has been heavily involved in tribal governance and politics as well, and um, sat around with many tribal leaders and have learned how they think about the decisions that they have to make, whether it's uh, natural resources decisions, economic decisions, health and welfare decisions for our, our nations. And um, what it comes down to is, is what was mentioned before is uh, shifting that paradigm of how we uh, assess our outlook uh, for us in, in tribal country, it's it's that seven generations, it's who's coming behind us and making decisions for them, for their well-being, for their future, and to, to start to get at how do we fight back against that, that scarcity pr principle, which as humans, we're all wired to, like, it's sur that survival mode, like when things start to dwindle and you know, you see that last cookie on the plate, you know, like that's, we're wired to want to have that for ourselves, like to take it for ourselves. Um, that's just like survival instinct. But when we talk about resource management, fisheries management, uh, fisheries conservation, uh, we have to start getting 
uh, beyond the like letting go of that need for that instant gratification, that short term gain, and instead turn our eye towards what's what's our long term benefit and how do we make decisions that feed that that um, feed that sustainable uh, use and sustainable pattern. Um, and so that's where I kind of uh, come back to on it is, uh, you know, if uh, a lot of it is fighting against our own human instinct, to, um, everybody loves that, uh, that instant gratification. You know, we talk, we, it's, we fight against it financially, we fight against it um, with our resources of, oh, I gotta have it for me, I gotta have it for my, my people right now today. Uh, but in reality, we need to be thinking we need to be making decisions that ensure uh, that these resources are here for, um, you know, our children's children's children. So. Following from what you're saying too, it sort of came to me that um, our political system is set up to think in terms of short-term thinking, short-term, literally short terms, two years for a representative. And it's hard to make a way through that constant change, if you like, with long-term thinking as well. And I'm not, I haven't got any good solutions to that one, but it did occur to me uh, that we have to find some ways around the short-term stuff and put in place some, some ways that value long-term more than what we're seeing right now in our political system. And I don't know how to do that. I first want to tell you I'm not a politician, um, too mouthy. But uh, at the same time, I, and my, as I puzzle my own way through this, as I've been doing for 50 years now, that's what I'm seeing going on. The long-term thinking is what is going to get us to where we need. But the short-term thinking is where a lot of the emphasis is placed. And how we change that is a big question. I like, I like how you're saying, um, I'm also too not yet. I always get into it. Um, <laughs> we need to talk. We need to talk. I, I think from a legislative perspective, uh, probably at the tribal and federal level, Washington State does not have a sound recovery plan that focuses on every watershed that collaborates and brings us recovery. So of course, scarcity is going to come when you don't have a unified plan. One of the greatest accomplishments, too, that I think are happening this year, Jack, one, is the Puget Sound Partnership is collaborating and bringing a eight regional plans together across the state, which includes both of your homelands. It brings together, and I learned this from Jeff, so he's a great teacher. Not only do we have the eight regional plans, every watershed has its own individual plan. Every one of these seven recovery plans includes state, federal, and tribal relationships. You unify and start identifying a baseline salmon recovery plan, then you're right. We incorporate every one of these habitat watershed plans that we have, we implement the regulations. We have more meaningful discussions on co-management, regardless of what your agreement is with the state and the feds. And we start collaborating and investing together. And we use science, and they always say, uh, I love science and science loves Deborah, because I always go back to the sound science that's gonna be able to provide that habitat. The second is you have a culvert plan. 17 years, salmon and fishermen sat on the beaches waiting for this lawsuit to happen. It's done. We have a mapping of the culvert plan that's being done by WDFW. You have your local government who's identified their culverts to be done. Jeff is doing another study that takes a look at, in collaboration with co-managers and the tribes, where all the habitat is that's prime and ready to go and where challenges are. Then we look at the urban and rural areas of how those need to get repaired and start prioritizing. Start prioritizing your watershed and your salmon recovery projects that need to get done because we need all of them done. But you need to prioritize those that are going to start returning faster and quicker than before. That's my own, that's like the world according to death, which can be very scary sometimes. <laughs> but that, when we start talking about from the political, looking through the forest and seeing the valley, that's what I hope to do in seven generations and having Cecilia running for governor. Having Jared run it for us, <laughs> Congressman. Like these are the type of hopes of things. And having Jeff be the head of NOAA one day, like I just have small dreams. But I think those are some of the things that we need to start looking for is what is the plan that we can get behind that reflects and overturns the idea of scarcity. Thank you. 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 Th
That's what Clem Jeff. I know you've heard it a thousand times. All right, I'm, I'll put in my resignation pretty quick here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a lot more phone calls. Um, I there there's a question here uh, that maybe Cecilia and Chair uh, Councilman Erickson can answer. Oh, there's folks in the in the audience that or online that um, have capacity and, and expertise that they would like to, uh, I'll say, share or provide in support of the tribe's efforts. Some of us work with the tribes every single day, uh, all day long, uh, and but there's some people out there that don't. So, do you have any advice on how folks that have that kind of knowledge and expertise might? strengthen or build uh, relationships with with the tribal staff to help support that um my contact information is on there they can get a hold of me and i can direct them into their fit the pin out of what side of the state they're on or where they want to help but the, as far as the upper columbia with you kevin can get a hold of our uh, executive director there or if it's call bill specific we can in our tribe um get hold of our ed I guess it's our natural resource slash slash ED right now, Cody, and they can coordinate with us as tribes and what we can do to help or if they have any resources that we don't already have access to that they can help with. Contact me and I can with the right people. Yeah, I, I would just echo that. Sometimes it's as easy as just picking up the phone and, and making a cold call, um, as uncomfortable as that might be. Um, but uh, like the councilman spoke to, uh, I also work for the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission, and we what we do is we essentially work for the 20 treaty tribes of Western Washington, and uh, we're always happy to help make connections. If you have a, a specific capacity that um, you know one of our member tribes might um, make use of, or or want or need, we're happy to make those connections, or even more broadly, uh, to help connect you with just the broader consortia of tribes. Um, we're happy to do that as well. So uh, it just kind of depends on what what uh, the individual's um, skill set is that they're wanting to bring to, to travel country. Um, but we're always happy to help make those connections. And then um, I might also include our, our sister organization uh, in the Columbia Crippin, who also has uh, some of the Eastern Washington tribes, collaborates a lot with UCUT and Northwest Indian Fish Commission. And then for those of you online, or those of you here, if you go to uh, the state government, uh, Governor's Affairs, uh, Goya is the, if you go on their website, they'll have a copy of uh, a picture of the map of all the Washington tribes, all of the contact information on there from the councilman and chairman all the way down to your natural resource directors, and they have definitions of the five treaty tribes. So say I'm working in Skagit, right, you know, and I'm working on fishing or hunting or gathering issues. I should be able to go to that website, click into the Skagit mapping area, look to see the treaty tribes that are there, find out who the chairman is, who is Swimmers Tribal Chairman Steve Edwards, go to the DNR, look into wildlife, and you'll find Tino's name. I won't give you Tino's cell number, but <laughs> that's just a little, another way that you could find information that's really helpful. Uh, I'll give you Tina's cell phone number for a small fee. Oh, wait, you got to split it halfway. Maybe maybe one final uh, juicy question. We've heard a lot about the political will question. Um, and in my mind, I, I always just think, and, and we'll have a little bit more maybe on this tomorrow morning uh, with Senator Rolfus. There's so much coming at the legislators all day, every day. Um, the legislative committees are parsed into particular categories, and yet things are all connected. Um, what, what, what would you say to us, um, whether we be the conservation biologists or, or human dimension scientists, what, what, what can we do to help support you in that political environment to bolster the political will to do the, the, the tough things, right? Like I, I heard Rep. McCannoff that you spoke to the protection and the recovery piece. You know, I also heard you speak to the, like, let's not lose any more ground. We have 
2 million more people predicted or estimated to be coming to Washington between now and 2050. So if we continue to do things the way we have, um, then we're in a, we're, we're probably having more passion around this conversation moving forward. So what, what advice would you give us uh, in, in how we might be able to, I don't know, structure our questions around the social science pieces or uh, what sort of biological information could we, could we provide that would help that political will be stronger to do the right things? You know, I, I want to share with my colleagues also, because I won't have the only answer, but um, one of the conversations that always come to mind that helps best represent uh, your uh, guidance to a state legislature is to tell your story. The story that you told Irene of the commercial fishermen and the numbers, I stood, I, I sat here and I, I really had to hold myself still for a minute because that is a story that we've heard from our tribal communities since, since, calling, since for 200 years. Um, it is the story, like, I'd love to see the analysis and the research, and I think the councilman and my friend Cecilia would say the same. The amount of number of commercial fishermen that have passed on due to the loss of their life ways. Imagine adding the travel communities on top of it and what the detrimental impact would be, not only to the social structure of their community, not only to the survival of us as Native American people, but to the economic viability. Uh, that's really important. Tell your story. Tell your story. If you know a friend's story, tell, tell them to send it into your state legislature. Put the title and the subject, Save the Salmon Across Washington State for Generations to Come. Build your science capacity. Our science tells us what needs to be done. Depoliticalize salmon. Salmon isn't a Republican issue. It's not a Democratic issue. It's not a Senate issue. It's not a House issue. It's not an executive branch, a legislative branch but it's turning into a judicial branch and it soon will get worse. The amount of money that we're gonna spend suing on salmon is the amount of money that we need in Washington state to address education, homelessness, health care, housing, infrastructure, transportation, not just for the state of Washington, but our tribal communities as well. Our tribal communities are set up just like state and federal governments. Tribal communities spend more money on their natural resources and their attorneys trying to get the job done right to preserve Senate for Washington State. And the state will end up doing the same. I think for those who are sitting on the other on the other side of the camera and for you here, build your capacity and reach out to your organizations. Washington Environmental Council has 150 environmental organizations across the state. And he says to hold the mic close. <laughs> has 150 environmental organizations across the state. Imagine if I had 150 salmon organizations across the state. Imagine if I had them joining with the 29 tribes. Imagine if I had them all sending information into Senator Rolfus and I. Imagine the governor who holds 34 to 38 of us together every two weeks to run, I would say 12 to 16 to 18 climate change bills a year. Imagine if Senator Rofus and I were holding with the governor meetings across the state legislature that built policy around salmon and hunting and gathering, held provisos and budgets that really reflected our investment with seeds on one hand and salmon and the other addressing growth and climate change together. Imagine in two years, Senator Rofus and I would have every year eight, 10, 12, 15 bills that really address salmon. We have budget provisos and budget line items that says, oh, we only increased it by 2%, but pretty much natural resources have stayed the same for the past 15 years. Imagine if we incorporated traditional knowledge into our state agencies that took the work that Jared knew of what needed to be done across that river, rather than having someone who didn't know that area yet. Imagine what we could do if we collaborated. So again, it's just Deb's world. I'm just an elected official, but it's a little bit of a few ideas. Thanks, Deb. Yeah. Um, that's, I can't remember your full question, Jeff, but to, to third point, she said it best. I mean, tell your own stories the best you can do, right? And, um, I, I too, not, 
no offense to Irene, had to bite my tongue a little bit. So coming from tribal communities, like you start talking about the average, you know, uh, life expectancy, it's very low for my communities. Very low. I mean, and the suicide rates are, I don't know how many declarations of uh, emergencies we've declared um, due to suicide. I don't know how many of you had to stop your family member or friend from, you know, shooting themselves with a gun, but I have. Um, it's not, it's not, it's not fun. And so one thing that was a uh, prescribed from a doctor who came during one of those, and this is from my, my chairman right now, he, he mentioned this to me, Andy Joseph Jr., that they prescribed fish oil, they wanted to prescribe some fish oil to the individuals. And we kind of, kind of threw them off. We thought it was due to, well, he fixed it, due to residential schools. So both my grandparents were survivors of residential schools, but they, they figured the best thing that for it and that we were without, especially the upper Columbia is salmon, not having that uh, fish oil, which kind of struck me as odd. I never thought about it in that sense because we have a lot of issues due to salmon also with diabetes and other health related issues. But um, yeah, just tell, I mean, telling your story, like even my, when I talk, talk about my grandparents, they're both residential school survivors. And you guys have probably seen a lot of that in the news lately. Um, my grandpa was in Chihuahua, my grandma was at St. Mary's Mission on our reservation. And then you start thinking about all the things that they went through. Um, my grandpa going to World War II, he left Grand Coulee Dam, you know, was just being built and not enough salmon runs had to stop getting. He came back, all our veterans, you know, World War II came back to, you know, no salmon. So um, that's one thing I would just say that common sense is, isn't as common as it used to be. So you can try to talk about traditional ecological knowledge. That's just, I mean, things you've learned, just common sense, some things. And we fight amongst ourselves about, you know, this or that, and that's why I said it's a formality. I went back to get my degree to come file, just I guess here I am, you know. But um, it's just getting common sense back into some of these things. Some of them aren't as big issues as you think they are. We start getting down into the weeds about everything, and it's like these species don't have very long, so we need to get past some of those things. Work, look at big picture, long term, like we've talked about here, um, and just back to the basics on a lot of the things. So that's all I can add. Um, something I do want to say is that one of the things that propelled me into doing that for a social study that I did was a health study that I saw that had been done for some of the upper river tribes on the Columbia. And it was huge, and I read it, and it brought a lot of things, uh, made it very clear to me about what was going on in salmon country, if you want to call it that. The rate of diabetes among the tribes was sky high. And I was looking at my own communities and wondering about some of that. So that was where some of the guidance came for the research I did. The problem was doing the research. It's very difficult to tease out these numbers from databases. And, and to some degree, this is relevant to what we're doing. Uh, I think in that we're not looking at the figures on a lot of this with even more, I guess I would say it sort of goes back to my can salmon swim through no man's land. We've got a pretty good idea of how many died, but how many were maimed? How many were wounded? What happened to those communities? What happened to the women in those communities when the men had died? All of them. And we haven't done any of that part of it. And I think it's the same with the salmon stuff, that we really haven't spent a lot of time except for certain body counts of salmon going over the dam, that sort of thing, and what we need to for hatchery escapement. But looking beyond that into some of the things that are really meaningful to us, I'm not sure we've done a whole lot of that. And I'm still groping my way through that after many years of, of struggling with it, is what's going on in the larger world? In terms of telling a story, no one's listening to us. We can't, haven't been able to get people to listen to us. They won't meet with us. It's like we don't exist, like we're somehow outside some moral circle that uh, has been drawn, but we're on the outsides. There are legislators that refuse to meet with us. We send letters, we don't get answers. We basically mean left out the human race at this point. Same thing happened in the timber community to some degree when the spotted owl uh, 
situation uh, was going on. Um, Dr. Robert Lee from the University of Washington talked about being left outside the moral compass when it came to being a logger. And when we start calling people names like brush apes, we, that is what we are doing. And when you start calling gillnetters, rapers of the resource, that is what you're doing. You're putting people outside the moral compass. And I think those are some of the social parts of the picture that we're really not picking up on or focusing on that are, are part of the pain that is going on in salmon country. Wow. Um, so if you will, please help me thank these amazing panelists. Thank you so much for your words. Uh, hopefully you get to stick around and I'm sure a lot of people will want to take up more conversation with you at our social. Um, but for now, if you don't mind, help, help.